Okay, good morning. I thought I'd start our session this morning with some Amma piano music. Um, this was the first song that I heard, and I thought this is the um, this is Amma piano because he sings Kokota piano. Uh, but apparently, it's um, it's a genre like you you've taught me. So thank you for that. Now um, I don't. I will appear a bit less stupid when I talk about music in future. Right. <laughs> okay, so we can start. Let's make sure my phone is on silent and everything's ready, and we are being um, we are recording the session. Good. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you, uh, Mahlatsi. You taught me something there. Um, Okay, so we today uh, we are continuing with leases, um, and we are going to. Oops, we are going to. Oh, come on! No, it, everything goes wrong. You don't want it to go wrong. There we go. So um, today we are finishing up with some of the um, uh, the subsequent measurement for the lessee that we didn't get to in last week Thursday's lecture, and then we are going to start looking at the lessor and specifically the classification um, of leases uh, from the perspective of the lessor. Good. So, but before we start there, let's just quickly. Um, just tell me a little bit, how did it go with your first CVs? Did you survive it? Give me some, some feedback there. I see our headcount this morning is very low, so I suppose some of some of you have decided to, <laughs> to rather sleep in. If okay, good. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. And then I see a, a, a picture of a zombie there. I think it's this time of the year because I also feel like a zombie um, today and I didn't even write the CVs. FP is decent to good. Hmm, that's good. Well, decent. Auditing bad. Oh, <laughs> shame. Auditing concerning. <laughs> time limit was difficult. Was it the time for the um, completing the test or the time afterwards for the admin of loading loading the um, um, your, your workings? Was that the issue? Or was it just normal time for completing the test? Yeah, you have to get writing fit again. <laughs> okay, time management. So time management in the question itself seems like it. Okay. Yeah, I always, I'm always a bit always critical when a student tells me that um, uh, they need help, they can't finish on time, and time is an issue. Because I really truly believe that if you know your work, then time, well, no one ever... <laughs> Let me, let me say it this way. Very few people will be able to finish a question in time and get 100% for that. Um, however, so, so the timing is an issue. Um, you don't necessarily have to finish the, um, the question in time. Time will always be an issue. But your marks, the, if your marks are bad, it's not necessarily because you didn't have time. It's because you, many times it's because you were unsure, you didn't know your work well enough and you, you spend some time hesitating on uh, what should you do and how should you approach this scenario. And that's actually what, what um, takes up most of the time. Um, so if you know your work well, then actually it, it will go much quicker. Okay, the submission time felt short and stressful. It was short and stressful for us as well. Um, yeah, so um, okay, we don't want that to to be such a big issue, but um, yeah, we'll see. Um, obviously, we don't want you to we don't want to fail students because of submission, but we also have to be fair and have to do everything we can to um, prevent um, students from being unethical. Although I really, with all of my heart, I believe that we do not have unethical students. Okay, so. Um, yeah. So, but but still, we have to put some measures in place just to 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 prevent that. Okay. Submission time was stressful. Okay. And then I, I, uh, there was some kind of a weird thing that happened, and it told you that you uploaded the document that's um, zero KB. I don't know what a KB is, but um, then everyone stressed about that. But it was just a, a, a system. Your your documents were there. Okay. Kilobyte. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. A kilobyte. I will probably forget that uh, within the next 15 minutes, and then you can just remind me again. 
Good. I'm feeling this quote. I don't know about you, but um, I'm really feeling it. It's 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 getting quite long now, but um, measure of the file size. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Um, so uh, I'm feeling it. It's getting quite long now, but uh, we have another nice long weekend coming up. Uh, so that's something to look forward to, and then some uh, nice and restful year tests, year test weeks that we can look forward to. So, uh, yeah. So, so we'll um, we'll 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 survive this. All of us will survive it. Don't worry about it. Good. So um, uh, let's start with the lecture. Um, when's the long weekend? Ah, oh, shy, Mr. Miss Liani. Uh, it's Christmas for you because uh, I'm giving you off on the 27th of April and then you can also, on the 26th of April, you can also take the day off. <laughs> or you can study, but I mean you don't have to um, attend lectures or anything. So that's next week. Um, okay. If you guys are reminded, you have a better chance of studying and passing. Reminded of what? Mr. Shrempel, I missed... Uh, Oh, we still have year tests to do. So you're reminding them about the year tests. Okay, yes. I don't, I doubt if anyone needs reminding. I'm sure, it's all there in, uh, at the back of all of our heads. But um, yes, know that that's coming. Exciting, a chance to assess yourself and see um, where you are and what you still need to do. Okay, so today, isn't it fun? I'm coming to you from the, from the Ruiz Hall. Do you recognize the Ruiz Hall? Um, I actually don't like the rehearsal. I always get uh, anxiety when I walk in here because when I was a student, we used to write all our tests here. So never had, we didn't really have lectures here, so, but we did have, write tests. So um, I'm feeling that anxiety. But um, yeah, we'll we'll carry on. I can remember I, I never used to smoke, but every time when we were writing tests here outside the Chancellor's building, when everyone else was standing there smoking, I really felt the need. I thought to myself, oh, maybe I should just start because I feel as if I need a cigarette um, before writing this test. So when I walk in here, I'm always reminded of that um, that 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 need for to start smoking. But it will never happen. It will, don't worry about it. It won't happen. I, I, I tried smoking once when I was um, like 15, maybe. But my dad smoked very strong cigarettes. So I stole two of his for something like Texan pain. So I didn't even have a filter. And I smoked both of those cigarettes in a very short time. I thought I looked very cool um, while doing it. But I was so sick after that. I was sick for almost two days. So after that, I could never um, touch a cigarette again. So good lesson for you when you have children one day. If they um, want to try smoking, buy them a packet of cigarettes and make them smoke two cigarettes in one go. And um, probably they will never touch, touch cigarettes again. Okay, parenting advice. Finished, now we carry on with I for a 60, not 17, sorry, 60. Okay, so um, in Thursday's lecture, we looked at the the male reassessments. Um, so that it was that, um, uh, no, sorry, it's the, it's the female. So we looked at the female reassessments where we had the change in the lease term and the change of the um, uh, purchase option, whether we are going to uh, make use of the extension uh, option to extend the lease term or to um, uh, terminate the lease earlier, or the option to now um, purchase the, the asset, uh, whereas originally we thought, no, we're not going to purchase this asset. So we looked at those two reassessments. Okay, so um, now in today's lecture, we are now going to look at the, the um, uh, the male reassessments, which is the change in the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee, as well as a change um, in the lease payments linked to an index rate. Good. So we start with the first one. So the first one um, we find an example four. Oh, my slide is not updating. There we go. So an example four that is um, a change in the amount payable under uh, re the residual value guarantee. So it's um, this reassessment that we are looking at now. So in example four in your notes, we are going to do that example now. Good. Oh, this is very small. Um, but you've got the example in front of you. Let me quickly see if I can make it bigger. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. Hmm. I don't know if that really worked. 
so in this example, they tell us that um, Carmen here Limited entered into a, a lease agreement to lease a building on the 1st of January 2016, which is the commencement date. The lease is for five years. In terms of the lease agreement, the lease payments will be 155000 payable annually in arrears. In terms of the lease agreement, if the fair value of the retail building at the end of the lease term is less than 450000 then Common Air Limited must pay the lessor um, uh, the amount calculated as the difference between that fair value and the amount of 450000 So this 450000 is our residual value guarantee. Good. Um, on the commencement date, the fair value of the building uh, was 400000 um, at the end of the lease term. So at the beginning of the lease term, um, uh, uh, the lessee said, okay, I think at the end of the lease term, um, I'm going to be, to be using this uh, asset quite um, a lot. So I think the fair value is going to be worth 400000 So therefore, the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee is therefore um, at the uh, commencement date of the lease, we think is going to be 50,000. That's going to be the amount of cash that we will have to pay in terms of the residual value guarantee. Okay. However, then at the end of the year, we change that, um, that estimate. And now we realize that actually, um, uh, we are, we are, it's not going to be as bad as we thought. Now the fair value, we think the fair value of the asset at the end of the lease term is going to be 410. So therefore the amount payable in terms of the res residual value guarantee has now decreased to only 40,000. Okay. Um, so this happens, this is at the beginning of the lease term at the commencement date. That's the date where we do our, all our initial calculations and our initial entries, initial recognition. Then for the entire year, we would have um, used the, the amortization from that first calculation. And then at the end of the year, we realized, mm, no, this residual value um, amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee is going to change. Okay, no initial direct costs, 31 December reporting date. And then they give us two um, interest rates. We get an interest rate um, uh, at the commencement date of 10.5%. And then we get, um, they give us as well, uh, the interest rate, uh, incremental borrowing rate at the end of um, the year on the date that we uh, reassess the lease liability. And that is now the new rate of 10.75. Okay, so they're considering now that the is a, a, a male reassessment that, oh, we knew it was probably going to change. Which rate are we going to use? Are we going to use, um, when we do our reassessment, are we going to use the old rate or are we going to use the new rate? Okay, I will help you with that. If we go to, oh, today my laptop does not want, oh, my um, fingers do not want to, um, work on the touch screen. Okay, let's try again. So, um, so what they tell us um, in, in paragraph 42, they say if we have a, a change in the amount expected to be payable under the residual value guarantee, we are going to use an unchanged discount rate. Um, so that means we still will conti can continue using the original rate in the lease agreement, which was the 10.5% our original rate. Yes, like Mr. Shrempel and uh, Ms. Sloppy said. Okay, so initial measurement of the lease liability. Um, we did that calculation based on the information that we uh, that provided for us on the commencement date. So I've got my payment date. Uh, we said that we are probably going to have to pay 50000 in terms of the residual value guarantee. So that's going to be our future value. Leases for five years. Interest rate was originally 10.5%. And then we calculated what our present value was. So that was the present value of the... Um, where can you find these paragraphs? In Sorry, I'm... Um, Paragraph 42 and paragraph 43. Okay. Okay, so this uh, present value of the lease liability um, was, will then be our um, first journal entry that we do where we are going to credit the liability and debit the right of use asset with a 610493. Okay, then. Um, uh, so, so that will be our first journal where we debit the right of use asset, credit the lease liability, and then at the end of the year we will um, have a depreciation expense on our right of use asset. 
Um, we will, uh, oh, and note this, we never mentioned this specifically in the previous lectures, but you would have done this in FRK 201. Note that we do not have an accumulated depreciation account for our right of use asset. Um, so we take the depreciation to right of use asset retail building. So the same, we only have one account for the right of use asset. We don't have a, um, a at cost and a accumulated depreciation account for right of use asset. Okay, so we do our depreciation, then we do our AMORT function based on our um, initial recognition um, calculation. We recognize the um, interest expense or the finance cost, and then we also um, uh, recognize the, the, the capital payment that, that, that's included in the amount that we are paying, so that the, these two give us our uh, net capital amount that we are re uh, paying and then um, balance all the cash amount that we are paying for our lease um, liability in terms of the lease agreement, the lease payment. Okay, and again, you are welcome to do a net journal for these two journals. Good, so we do all of that. Now we get to the end of the year and now we realize, okay, now the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee is going to change. So uh, what we do now is we have to now go and um, calculate how much uh, will our lease liability now change because of this change in the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee. So at year end, the balance that we currently have in our GL account will be 519595. And that will also, it will be the net effect of the initial recognition of the liability um, as well as in the, uh, the repayment, the capital portion that we repaid. So that balance is then 519595 five, sitting in my lease liability at the end of the year. Now on that same date, we now uh, have to redo our calculation because of the fact that we see that we are now only going to have to repay 40,000 in terms of the residual value guarantee. So we do our calculation now and um, note that now we use the remaining term of the lease. So paragraph 43, uh, 40, 42 and 43 tells us that we have to do our calculations over the remaining um, uh, lease term. So because one year is now gone, our remaining term will be four years and we use our unchanged discount rate. And then what we see is we get a present value, and so we're saying that this is what my lease liability balance should be after the reassessment. Currently, the balance is sitting at 519,595, but it should be 512,887. So we need to do a journal to fix that liability balance. And the journal that we do then on the 31st of December will be to, so what are we doing? We are decreasing the lease liability from 519 to um, 512887. So we're decreasing it with 6708. And then the other leg of this journal goes to my right of use asset. Okay. So that's the reassessment um, uh, for a change in the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee. Okay, so any, any questions or issues on that? Let's see. Okay, quite straightforward, nothing really weird here. Um, okay, so then we can just carry on. Then the next one, the last reassessment that we have to look at, the last male reassessment, is then a change in an index or a rate. So what happens here is we have a lease payment that is linked, how would we do a link, linked to an index or a rate. Okay, so when, this, the, when the lease payment now changes, then obviously, or when the index or the rate changes, in the lease payment is going to change and if that happens then my lease liability value is also going to change um, meaning that we will have to remeasure that lease liability okay um, so so that's the last um, reassessment that we are going to look at in terms of um, paragraph 42 and 43 okay i see a question here on the on the uh, chat so because we use the old rate does this affect our implicit um interest uh, Implicit interest rate. Okay, so because we are using, still using the old rate, that for if you uh, take into account that these are the the lease payments for the next four years, we are going to pay forty thousand at the end of the lease term. 
uh, my n is going to be my is my remaining least term. Then the 10.5 is for the, for these terms that is my interest rate implicit in the lease. Okay, so even after the change of the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee, that 10.5 percent is still my um, um, interest rate implicit in the lease. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Van Amerwe, what the old rate? I'm not sure if I, if, I, if I understand your question there. Why the old rate? Maybe that's what you're asking. Um, so we're using the old rate because it specifically tells us in paragraph 43 that we should use an unchanged discount rate. Okay, but let's let's stop stop for a moment here. Um, and, and, and just look at these these four types of reassessments that we have. So yes, the quick answer there is that for these two reassessments, we will use a new rate, and for these two, we will use an old rate. Why do we do that? Because IFRS 16 says that we should. But let's think about it logically. Why does IFRS 16 say that for these two, we use a new rate, and for these two, we use an old rate? Okay, so think about it, an interest rate, is something that is linked to to time okay so interest is linked to time um, so if we are now changing if we are changing the lease term um, we are effectively changing the uh, the entire lease uh, um, agreement it, it's, a, it's a completely almost a completely new lease agreement um, uh, be, be, because we are now changing that lease term. So because um, originally it was a, a four-year lease, a lease term, now it's a six-year lease term, um, that changes the, the, the essence of the lease contract. Or, so that's why we will use a new new rate. Whereas it's the same goes for a purchase option. If we originally said, no, we're not going to purchase this lease or this asset at the end of the lease term, and now we change our minds so and we say, no, now we are definitely going to make use of that purchase option. Again, the nature of that contract is changed because originally when we said we're not going to exercise the purchase option, we thought that we are only going to use this asset for a short while. Now it's if we now decide we are going to um, uh, exercise the purchase option, it almost becomes more like a financing transaction to purchase an asset, um, not just a lease transaction. So that's why these two um, reassessments actually change the nature of the lease contract, meaning that we will use a new lease, a uh, new interest rate. Whereas these two here at the bottom, the change in the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee and the change of the index in, or, or the rate, this initially, this amount that we put into our future value for the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee was just an estimate. We think it's going to be this much, or we're not sure. And so when that estimate changed, it changed the nature of the contract. So that's why we will still use the, the old interest rate. Why am I hearing myself? Okay, and now I'm gone. Indriti, come and help, please. Okay. I don't know what, what happened, why I'm not sharing my screen anymore. I think I lost something. So just a moment, we are having some technical difficulties. Here. I'll play you some music while we sort it out. Sorry, I don't know uh, what happened there, um, but now we can continue. Um, okay, so um, so that's why for these two reassessments here at the bottom, it's we're not changing the essence or the terms of the lease contract. We are um, um, uh, we are actually um, it's still the same lease contract. That's why we continue using the old rate. Still can't see anything. It says um, your connection isn't good enough to share applications right now. Hey, Indriki. <laughs> it says your connection isn't good enough to share applications right now. Yes, I don't know why. No screen. 
Can you hear me at least? I can see. Mr. Kluter can see. We have the session. What does that mean? I can't see. Just refresh. I can't. Can you yeah, refresh? Magic crystal ball would have seen this coming. Okay. Is it better now? Can you see and hear me now? If you refresh the screen or visible again, Ms. Willems says she can see me and we are back. Yes, we're back. Whew, okay. Um, now, but I've just, uh, unfortunately, I've lost um, uh, some, of the, some of the chats, so I can't see, um, yeah, I, I can't see some the old chats anymore. Um, but I, I, my, I just fell on a chat saying um, what she means is, so thank you for, if there are some interpreters out there um, uh, to interpret what I mean. Um, can't see the screen, still can't see the screen. Um, try refreshing, refresh the whole page. Hmm. I do not know. Press F5. Must I press F5 or who? I had to rejoin for it to work. Okay, Mr. Schwenbel says he can see. Um, who else said they can't see? Okay. Can't, Ms., uh, Mr. Holt, can you see something now? Okay. Refreshing has worked. Cool. Okay, then we can continue. Okay, so basically that is why we are using um, new rates for these two types of reassessment because it essentially changes the nature of the uh, lease agreement or the lease contract, whereas for the bottom two, we still use the old rates because this was just based on, um, we knew originally that the um, this assessment of the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee is going to change as well as we knew that um, when we base our lease payments on an, on an index or rate that, that is going to change in future future okay um, Ms. Marie if our uh, residual value guarantee at the end of the year is determined to be higher than the initial residual value guarantee would we debit right of use asset and credit lease liability and would we need to increase depreciation for the right of use asset um, Okay, so first of all, your, we, our residual value guarantee cannot change, but the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee is going to change. Okay, so what happens uh, happened here is our residual value guarantee um, stayed that, uh, at 450000 but because the residual value changed, the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee changed. And yes, so in this, in this um, example, our um, residual value guarantee um, with uh, the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee went down but obviously it can the amount can go up as well so we can realize at the um, a year into the lease we can realize or oh, oh no um, instead of the fair value of this asset being four hundred thousand uh, we actually think it's now only going to be three hundred and eighty thousand meaning the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee is going to go up and if that is the case then um, uh, our lease liability is also going to increase and when the lease liability increase will go credit lease liability debit right of use asset and then next year my depreciation on the right of use asset will also be um, will also increase okay so Ms. maria i hope i answered you there does the change in the assessment work both ways in other words if we initially choose not to purchase and then we just yes 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 so both ways so um, if we originally said we are going to purchase and then we change our minds, we're not, then it works exactly the same way or the other way around. Okay, so if we originally thought we are not going to extend the lease and now we are going to extend the lease, or if we originally thought we are going to extend and now we don't, 
same thing. Okay, um, I meant the amount payable, so we wouldn't have to change the current year's depreciation. No, so the current year's depreciation expense over here was based on the um, on the amount that we um, uh, that, that we calculated at the beginning or we, that we um, determined at the beginning of the lease term, um, and, and uh, to, which is the amount payable in terms of the residual value guarantee. And so, so that's not going to change. Now, the, I know when we when um, when you think about IS8, if we have a change in um, uh, uh, residual value um, the, uh, in terms of IS8, a change in estimate, then what we usually do is we go back to the beginning of the year and we calculate the, the, uh, the depreciation based on that new changed residual value, uh, residual value in terms of IIS16 PPE. However, for IFRS16, we don't do that. We actually, on the date that we make that reassessment, um, on that date we change it. So we won't change the depreciation for the year because we only make the reassessment at the end of the year. Good. Okay. So then um, last one, the last um, reassessment that we will have is when we have a change in an um, index or a rate and that change in the index in, um, uh, or rate actually changes my lease payment amount. So that's what happens now with this last um, uh, reassessment. Okay, so here we will look at example five, which explains um, this for us. So here again, same company entered into a lease agreement. Um, commencement date was 1st of January X16. Lease is for eight years, so that's the end. Um, lease payments are payable, payable annually in arrears. And the lease payment amount is 800,000. So that's my lease payment amount initially. Um, but then the contract says that the lease payments are going to increase every two years on the basis of the CPI index, the consumer price index, um, uh, on based on what the CPI index was for the, uh, for the previous two years. Um, so that means that if this is now our lease term or a portion of our lease term for the first four years, then initially we are going to, uh, we've got our uh, lease payments of 80,000 at the um, uh, initially um, that we agreed on in our lease uh, contract. And that's going to be the amount that I pay for the first year as well as for the second year. However, then what I'm going to do after two years is I'm going to uh, go back and, and see, okay, but the CPI index on this date was X. But for these two years, the CPI index, the average of the CPI index for these two years was Y. So therefore, my lease payments for the next two years are going to be based on the CPI index of Y, whereas um, the first two lease payments were based on the CPI index of X. Okay. Should it be 80,000 80, and not 800,000? Might be. Let's see when you look at the answer. Okay. Um, so now, what, what happens was um, on the first of January X16, the CPI index was 110. So that was the CPI index that we used to calculate the. Oh, okay. Here yeah, I'm, I'm missing a zero to calculate the the lease payment of um, 800,000. Now um, this increased to 130 on the 31st of December X17. So now my new CPI index for my new lease payments is going, um, is going to be based on a CPI. New lease payments are going to be based on a CPI index of 130. Good. Um, no initial direct cost, reporting date 31 December. Interest rate implicit in the lease is not readily determinable. The incremental borrowing rate um, on the 1st of January, X16 was 9.5%. And now I'm trying to catch you out by giving you um, uh, uh, an, an interest rate, a new interest rate on the 31st of December, X17. But remember now, we know that this is a male reassessment, and a male reassessment means, oh, we knew from the start that this is going to change, so we stick with the old rate. Okay. Um, so now we have to calculate our we have to calculate what our new lease payment is going to be. Well, let's first do just do initially initial recognition for this lease agreement. 
So initial recognition for this lease agreement, uh, we're going to use the 800,000 as our payment amount, eight years is our lease term, and the 9.5 interest rate on the commencement date. And that gives us then our present value, which is going to be my lease liability, credit, and debit um, uh, right of use asset. Okay. Um, so after two years now, that will be my um, uh, um, balance, uh, outstanding balance for my lease liability. Um, and on this date now, we, re we dis uh, decide, okay, now, but now the lease payments are going to change. So let me do our, my our little timeline here at the top. So we, we paid our um, first lease um, payment over here and over here, and that was based on the CPI index of 110, and we paid 800,000. And the same over here, 800,000. Now, at year end, we realize, okay, the CPI has changed, so that means that the next lease payment, the lease payment that we are going to have to pay over here, will be based on a CPI index of 130. So what we now do is we have this reassessment of the lease liability, but the, we will take the, these new lease payments into account for the period in which the cash flows are going to change. So the cash flows are only going to change for this, um, from this lease year over year, which means our reassessment is going to happen on the first day of um, the, next, uh, um, uh, the next financial year, next lease year. Okay, so we don't do that reassessment on year, year end, we do it on the, well, the 1st of January of the next year. Okay, so again, um, we have to use the old rate. We know now that that is what we, are, that we have to use. And, um, uh, and then also um, discounting the revised lease payments. Okay, good. So first of all, we have to calculate what our new lease um, payment is going to be. So how do we calculate that? And I saw someone um, uh, did the calculation here already or, or already knew. What, yes, so Mr. Armstrong said, so do you take the 800,000, divide by the 110, multiply it by the 130 to find the new lease payment? Exactly. That is exactly what we are going to do. Okay. So for uh, 110 CPI um, uh, index amount, we our lease payment was 800,000. 800, now it's the CPI changes to 130, so we have to now calculate our new lease payment. So to do that, we'll just divide by 110, multiply by 130, and this is our new lease payment amount. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. Um, okay, so then now we are going to um, use uh, the new lease payment amount. Again, we use the remaining term of the lease, which on this date will be um, six years, and we still use our old um, uh, rate, the 9.5% old rate um, that we used originally, and we calculate what our um, lease liability on that date should be. Okay, and now if we compare this lease liability amount that it should be to what it is actually after the two years, we see that we have to do a reassessment of that lease liability. Okay, so the journal that we have to do on the 1st of January 20x18, because that's the year from which the cash flows are going to change, um, uh, will be to now, so what do we have to do? Our lease liability is increasing, so we have to increase the lease liability, and the other leg goes to the right of use asset. Okay, um, let's see what else did I want to show you? Okay, yes. So um, I saw a good question here. Um, uh, how would the initial direct cost and the lease incentives affect this whole calculation? Good question. How would it affect this calculation? Let's think about it. What do we do with um, when we pay when the lessee pays those initial direct costs? So the lessee, um, when they pass, they will go credit bank, and what do they debit with the initial direct costs? Does the initial direct cost of the lessee have anything to do with the lease liability? Now it doesn't because we debit the right of use asset. So it goes to, it increases the, the value of the right of use asset, but it does not affect the lease liability. Same thing um, regarding the um, uh, lease incentives. So when we receive that lease incentive, 
uh, we'll say um, debit bank with the amount that we receive and we will credit the um, uh, right of use asset if we received it uh, before the date of the um, before the on or before the commencement date okay if it's after then it's just part of my cash flows that I will use in this calculation to calculate my um, my my present value and my lease liability okay we will use that CP thing <laughs> what is the CP thing and then net present value I think okay I'm not sure if I understand you, Mr. Duplessis, um, but okay, let's carry on. I can only think of the change it would have on the cost price of the asset and the depreciation, exactly. Um, so I would add it to the, um, no, so you're not going to, am I now, so like I said, initial direct costs are, are added to the right of use asset. They do not affect my, um, uh, my uh, lease liability. Okay, what if the change in the CPI happens in the middle of the financial year? Okay, but remember this, this agreement said, that um, we, it's going to keep the, we're going to keep it the same for two years, and then we are going to look at okay, now what's the new CPI rate, or we, what was the CPI rate for the last year, and then we change it. So it's not so the um, the CPI index may change, you know, every month, go up and down every month. But our, um, we are going to say now the lease payments are only going to change. Um, you know, so only at, at, at the end of the year, before we now have to calculate what, so, say for example, the lease payments change every year based on the CPI. Then what's going to happen is at the end of the year, we will make our first lease payment amount, which will be based on the, our old CPI index of 110. Now for the new financial year, now if we're standing over here in the new financial year, we'll say, okay, now the CPI index is 130, so the lease payment that I'm going to pay at the end of the year is 100, uh, will, should be based on the 130, and, and then we, we change it. We, have, we reassess then on the first day of, of that second year. Okay. Um, okay, you can also refer to paragraph 24. Thanks for that. Is there an example of the change in lease payments resulting from a change? Okay, we'll get to that, Mr. Trianicht. <laughs> okay, example six. Good, good, good. Thanks. I mean, cash flow thing. And no, I see I was wrong. Okay, good. Cool. But you're not wrong, Mr. Duplessis, um, uh, because like I said, if those um, lease incentives say after, say the contract says that after three years, we will get a percentage of our lease payments back or something like that, then, then it will form part of my, my calculation to calculate my, my, my lease liability. And then you will you have to use your cash flow function um, on your calculator because then you can't use the payment. Okay. Good. Okay. So now before we get to example six, which you are you guys are already in anticipating, um, just note that what happens in this question is that our payment amount is linked to something outside of our lease agreement. So it's linked to the CPI index or it's linked to the inflation rate or something like that. It's linked to something that's out side of the lease agreement that doesn't have anything to do with our lease agreement okay so that's why we also continue using the old rate um, because that was my initial um, rate that I, that I would have used now when we get to um, uh, uh, when we look at when you look at example 43 we'll look at it now you'll see that now in, in um, example 43 paragraph 43 we see that paragraph 43 talks about something uh, regarding an, a floating interest rate. So what we have done now in, um, in our previous example is we have looked at a situation where the lease payments were linked to an index or a rate, and this index or the rate was something that was outside of the lease um, agreement, didn't have anything to do with the lease agreement. However, when we have a change um, in the interest rate, because the interest rate is linked is um, a floating interest rate, then this is also going to change our payment amounts, but now our payment amounts are going to change. They're also going to be variable pay, um, payments, but they are going to change because of the fact that the interest rate of the lease is changing. Okay, so that is our our fifth situation that we are looking at now. So it's not part of our reassessments, and you'll see why it, why it isn't part of that uh, just now. But this is the fifth situation that we have to look at. And be careful, don't get confused between this 
fifth um, situation and the one that we just did with our payment changes uh, based on an index or a rate. Okay, so let's um, uh, really look at what paragraph 43 said. So for paragraph 43 said that we have to use an unchanged discount rate for these two types of mail reassessments. But then paragraph 43 also says that unless this change in the lease payments is as a result of a floating interest rate. If that is the case, then we will use this revised interest rate, this floating interest rate um, uh, in our calculations. Then we won't stick to the old, um, the unchanged old um, rate. We will actually use this revised interest rate. Because what is happening here is that the rate changes, and because the rate changes, um, my, uh, the rate of my lease changes, so therefore my payment amount is also going to change. Okay, so let's look at example six for the floating interest rate. Okay, so Mr. Tiernich, here we go. So what happens in, in example six? Um, again, the commencement date is the 1st January X16. Uh, the lease is for three years, so my N will be three. Uh, lease payments uh, will be... Um, Annually paid in arrears, one nine five six hundred. No initial direct cost, no lease incentives, no restoration cost to be provided for. Um, they tell us that the interest rate um, in the lease varies with the prime lending rate. On the 1st of January, X16, the interest rate implicit in the lease was 7.75% per annum, which was the same as the prime lending rate. Then on the 1st of January, X17, the prime lending rate increased to 9.25% per annum. So what happens here is when the lessor decided on how to account for um, uh, or, or, or at, what, at what amount they are willing to lease out this asset, they said, okay, but we want a return on our investment, which is at least equal to the prime interest rate. Okay, so therefore they said that the the the, um, the payment that they want, that the transaction is, is structured in such a way that the lessor's return on investment will be um, uh, equal to the in, um, the prime lending rate. So that means when the prime lending rate now changes, the lessor still wants now the new prime lending rate to be its return on investment. So therefore the payment amount is going to have to change so that the lessor still gets that return on investment. Okay, so initially we would have used um, uh, that prime lending rate um, um, on the date of the inception um, or commencement of the lease, our lease payment term is three years, and that would have given us our um, uh, right of use asset debit, credit lease liability. Okay. Okay, now a year later, this would be our outstanding balance of the lease liability. Now, what happens is the prime lending rate changes. And because the prime lending rate is going to change, so that's the interest rate that's included in this lease. The rate that we should use for this lease is going to change. Therefore, the payment amount is also going to change. So can you see the difference between example six and example five? In example five, the payment amount changed because of something outside of the lease agreement. Whereas here, the payment amount is changing because the interest rate um, uh, uh, of the lease is going to change because it's linked to the, um, uh, the prime lending rate. Food. So what happens, um, we know that uh, um, when we have our lease payments um, or any amortized, um, uh, li amortized cost uh, liability when we make our pay uh, payments, that payment amount consists of an interest portion and a capital portion. Okay, when you do your amortization table, make sure you understand how an amortization table works. Go and put it in Excel, make sure it works, or you understand how it works. But you'll see that the payment amount has an interest portion and a capital portion. Now, if the interest rate changes, so let's say the interest rate goes up, then what's going to happen is my interest portion of my lease payment is going to increase. So in total, my lease payment is going to increase because I now have to pay more interest. Whereas if the interest rate goes down, the interest portion of my lease payment is now going to be smaller 
meaning that my total lease payment amount is also going to decrease. Good. So, so that's why the payment amount changes when the interest rate changes. So if we now have to calculate what our new lease payment is going to be um, uh, um, from the 1st of January 2017, we want to know what the payment amount is. Uh, where future value will stay zero. Um, now our remaining lease term is two years. We originally had three years. The remaining lease term is, is two. Um, our interest rate has now changed to the 9.25 floating interest rate. And that means that um, we now want to be also, wait a minute, this is not going to work. I now need a payment amount and I need a present value amount. How am, I, uh, how am I going to put that into my financial calculator to calculate what my payment, new payment amount is going to be? Okay, so it, the, 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 it, this isn't such a big issue. It isn't an issue at all because of the fact that, remember, when the interest rate changes, my interest portion of my um, lease payments change. But the, the actual amount that I owe to the lessor does not change. So this outstanding balance that I owe to the lessor does not change. The only thing, the only reason why my lease payments are now going to change in future is because of the fact that the interest portions of my lease payments are going to change. So that means that my present value does not change. So on that date of the reassessment, I still use this the, the outstanding balance of my lease liability as my present value. I don't know, I don't owe the lessor um, more money now. Cap the capital amount does not change because of the fact that the interest rate changes. So the interest rate changes and it's going to affect my payment just because of the fact that the interest portion is now going to be smaller or bigger because of the interest rate change. However, the um, outstanding amount that I owe them does not change. Okay, so that's why you still use my, my, my the same present value and now I can calculate my new lease payment. Okay, and this is the same way that a mortgage loan um, works. So, for example, when uh, we bought our house, we, um, uh, we, we, we also bought it with floating interest rates. So if the interest rate goes up, then my monthly payment is going to go up and the interest rate goes down, then my monthly payment is going to go down. However, the amount that I owe the bank does not change because of the fact that that interest rate goes up and, um, or down. Okay, so it's basically just the same principle. So therefore, um, oh, have I got that example here? No, 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 no. So therefore, you'll see in example six, you'll see in example six that on the 1st of January 2016, there's no journal. We don't have to do any journal on that date because of the fact that my, my outstanding amount did not change. This, so this is why this fifth situation is not a, a reassessment of my lease liability. It is just an additional situation where my payment amount might change, but the, actually the lease liability right of use asset is not affected by that. Okay, so um, can you see the difference between um, uh, um, when my, when my payment amount, this is when my payment amount changes because of the change in the, in, in the floating interest rate. So this is the floating interest rate. And the change in my payment because it's linked to an index order rate um, over here. So can you see that difference? This is a reassessment, whereas this is not a reassessment. Okay. How did you get to the 305006 present value? Okay, let's go back. 305. So, um, let me. So, the 305006 is just, I used my initial amount that they gave us. So, that was the initial um, lease payment. Lease term was for three years. The interest rate, um, prime interest uh, uh, lending rate on the date of the um, commencement of the lease was 7.75. So then I calculated what my, my lease liability was on the date of um, the commencement of the lease. So that was now on the commencement of the lease was on the 1st of January X16. Then now, now we are, are a year later. So um, a year later, um, on the, where did, where did they tell us? The same as. 
Uh, on 1st of January X17, now the prime lending rate increased to 9.25. So now in my next financial year, 1st of January um, X17, now my lease payment is going to change because my interest rate is, is changing. So I calculated this 3506 um, was just the outstanding balance of the lease liability at the end of 2016. So I just went amort, um, um, yeah, amort, um, second function amort um, and then it gave me the balance of the year one. One input, one shift amort. How's that? Okay. Are you saying that it should 305, 350, 006? Okay, so um, Tabuho, are you happy with that? Mr. Mashehu, are you happy with um, that calculation? Um, how would we then account for the change in payment? So only, the only thing that's now going to happen is in, oh no, I must just remember the amounts. Um, oh, it doesn't matter. So what's now going to happen is on the 31st of um, December 2017, so the next financial year, what's going to happen now is I'm going to do my journal. I'm going to say credit um, bank, and I'm now going to uh, pay the new amount that I now owe. And then, um, um, and using uh, um, using this that that amortization that we just did to calculate what this new payment amount is, or that present value calc that we did to calculate this new payment amount, when we now go and say amort um, one interest, um, one input, one amort, and then we get to the interest, it's going to tell us what our um, finance cost is going to be. And the other leg debit is going to go to my lease liability. So I just carry on with this um, the, the transaction normal way as with any other um, uh, lease liability. Um, uh, the only only difference now is that I'm using a new lease payment, and because of the, the interest rate has changed, now the um, finance cost is also going to be based on a, on a new rate. Good. Um, Mr. Mashi, who's happy? Um, Ms. Peter said, correct to say that if we are working with floating interest rate changes, it will not affect the right of use asset and depreciation will remain the same, which is not the case when we work with the male and the female changes. Correct. Yes. So the right of use asset are not affected by um, these uh, by this situation where we have floating interest rates. So the only, uh, Ms. Willem says, so the only adjustment are going to be interest um, ex expense, <laughs> interest expense journal on the lease payment. Exactly, that's the one that I just did. Mr. Armstrong, there's a typo in the notes and class examples. For, ex um, for example, 6, 31 December X16, but should it, but should be 2017. Um, oops, let's see. Um, on the 1st of January, interest rate implicit was 7. Point uh, which is the same as the prime lending rate on the 1st of January X17, the rate increased to 9225 um, under the suggested solution. Okay, so I don't have that in front of me, but if there is, sorry about that, we'll, we'll fix it. Um, good. Yes, so Ms. Willem said depreciation right um, of use asset won't be affected. Correct. Okay. So that's then everything I wanted to tell you on the um, uh, lessee. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Armstrong. I appreciate that. Um, if you were, if we were in class now, you would have, I would have given you chocolate for picking up a typo. Um, so unfortunately, you are not here, so I will be having the chocolate on your behalf. Okay, now for these lease reassessments that we did, those four lease reassessments where we had to adjust the right of use asset and the lease liability, just note the additional presentation um, or, or, or the additional disclosure that we will have. So in our for our right of use asset um, note, we will have to show what uh, how that um, right of use asset was um, adjusted for these um, lease liability reassessments. Um, and then um, in our lease liability note, obviously now we are going to use the um, the new lease payments um, if, if, if we now had to calculate um, new lease payments, which we would have only had to calculate um, yeah, if the lease payments were linked to an index or a rate, or if we had a, f a floating interest rate and our future lease payments are also changing. I accept cash too. Good to know. 
irrelevant, but good to know. Good. Okay, so that is that then for the lessee. Gosh, okay. So it um, took us longer um, than I thought, but it's good that we took the time to go through it properly. So that's everything I wanted to tell you on the C or um, all the new things on the on the lessee that you didn't um, learn last year in FRK 201. Uh, so now we can move on to the lessor. Okay, so we've got half an hour left, um, and we will spend that on the lessor. Okay. So um, first thing with the lessor, remember that if we go back to this picture, all the all the other. Um, um, uh, rules still count with regard to, say, for example, the, the identification of the components, the lease components and the non-lease components. That's applicable to the lessor as well, determining what the lease term is. Um, so the lease term is the non-cancellable lease term, uh, plus then the option to extend if it is reasonably certain that the lessee is going to choose that option, um, or uh, uh, less the option to uh, the period for the option to um, terminate the lease earlier if it's reasonably certain that the lessee is going to use that option to terminate um, earlier. So all of these things still count. Um, however, you'll see that uh, things are do look uh, are a little bit different when when it comes to the lease saw, um, especially when you see that the recognition exemptions. Um, do not apply for the lessor, but the lessor has other rules that um, also comes down, boils down to basically the same. Um, it's just interesting that the rules that the lessor has, um, yeah, you can actually have one lease transaction where the lessee creates a right of use asset and the lessor also still has the asset on its statement of financial position. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy actually between the um, lessee and the lessor in IFRS 16, um, which is interesting. Oh, but never mind, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, they, will problem, they, they might change that somewhere in the future. Okay, so the first thing for the lessor um, that we find in, so that's in uh, paragraph 61 to 66. They tell us that the lessor has to classify the lease um, on the inception date. So on the date that the, that the um, lease contract is, is, is inter entered into um, and everyone signs on the dotted line, on that date the lessor has to classify this lease. And the leases must be classified as either an operating lease or a finance lease. Okay, so with the lessee, we didn't have different types of leases. We have we had leases, and then we had the recognition exemptions for our short-term and low-value asset, low asset value leases. Um, but it was still just leases. Whereas now we have actually have two types of leases. We have an operating lease and a finance lease. Okay, so what is an operating lease and a finance lease? Um, so paragraph 62 tells us that um, a lease shall be classified as a finance lease when it substantially transfers all the risks and the rewards incidental to ownership of the underlying asset. So if the law actually transfers in essence the, the rights and the, the risks and the rewards of ownership to the lessee, then we call it a finance lease. Okay. Otherwise, if these risks and rewards are not uh, essentially transferred, then we call it an operating lease. Okay, so an operating lease is, uh, is, is the definition of an operating lease is a finance lease. So as simple as that. So here the um, uh, risks and rewards of ownership are not transferred. Okay. Um, so what are these risks and, um, and, and rewards incidental to ownership? We find some guidance then in the paragraph, in paragraph B53 um, on the, the risks and the rewards of ownership. So for example, the risks of ownership is that um, if there are any, um, any, any losses, if, if the, when this asset is used and we incur any losses, um, who's, going, who's going to carry those losses? Is, is it going to affect the lessor or is it always going to affect the lessee? If it's going to affect the lessee, then that's an that is the, the risk um, of ownership has been transferred to the lessee. Um, as well as um, the risk of, I can never pronounce that word, obsolescence. 
something like that. Um, so if the, if, if the asset now becomes obsolete, um, who's going to, to, um, to have to, uh, who carries that risk that when the, the asset becomes obsolete, that it has to be replaced? Is it the, the lessor or the lessee? Um, and if a changes in economic conditions now affect the, the fair value of that asset, who's going to be affected by that? So those are some of the risks of ownership. Some of the rewards of ownership is who's going to gener um, who's going to benefit from the profits um, that's going to be generated by this asset. Um, if the value in the asset now goes up, um, who's who's going to benefit from that? If there's a, a, an increase in the value, and if the residual value at the end of the lease term also is going to go up or down, or, um, or, or is going to increase. So at the end of the lease term, um, uh, the you'll be able to sell it for a big amount or a small amount. Who, who's going to be rewarded by that? Okay, so that's the risks and the rewards of ownership. Okay, um, so, so we have to decide when we decide to classify a lease as either a finance lease or an operating lease, we have to look at these risks and rewards. Do they stay with the lessor or are they transferred to the lessee? If they are transferred to the lessee, it means we have a finance lease. If they stay with the lessor, it means we have an operating lease. Good. Okay. So we we are getting some more guidance. Don't worry about that, Mr. Armstrong. We're getting to it. Yes. So um, uh, so basically, basically, a, a finance lease is almost as if the lessor is selling the asset. So it doesn't not necessarily. It doesn't have to necessarily sell the asset. The uh, ownership does not have to transfer. We'll see that just now. Um, but the, for finance lease, the lessor is going to de-recognize the asset and only recognize an, a receivable um, uh, uh, from the lessee. Whereas for an operating lease, it's almost like Avis rent a car. So um, uh, the lessor stays the owner of, of, of that. that um, Avis, Avis stays the, the owner of the, the vehicle. Um, me as the lessee, I just quickly use it for a bit and then I bring it back to, to Avis. So that's in essence the difference between the two. Okay, now with that we've got a sort of a picture of the difference between the finance lease and the, fin and the uh, operating lease. Let's go and look what the standard says in paragraph 63. So here in paragraph 63, we, we are provided with some, some guidance on how to decide whether an asset should be a finance lease or an operating lease. And it's interesting, um, this... Uh, uh, the, the, less, the treatment for, le uh, for a lease for the lessor um, um, stayed mostly unchanged from the previous standard, the one that I studied years ago, I, um, I-17. Um, so that stayed um, more or less unchanged. And it's actually, it's a very principle-based um, principle based situation that we have here. So they're not, they do not provide us with rules. They do not say that if this happens, then it is a finance lease. And if this is included in the contract, then it is an operating lease. So you'll see that it's very principle based, a very nice topic here for a theory discussion um, to decide whether a lease should be classified as an operating or a finance lease, because it's not rule based, it's principle based. So, so they tell us that, um, they give us some examples of situation that individually or in combination um, would normally lead to a lease being classified as a finance lease. So it doesn't not necessarily mean that if one of these situations is definitely there or is there that it's definitely a finance lease, but it might give us an indication that it is a finance lease. Okay, so the first one there has to do has to do with the transfer of ownership. If ownership is transferred to the lessee, then that's an indication that the lessee is actually um, uh, getting all the risks and rewards of ownership. Um, so therefore, it seems that it should, will be a finance lease. Okay. Um, another example is where the lessee has the option to purchase the asset at a price that is expected to be sufficiently lower than the expected fair value. Um, at the date when this option becomes exercisable. So obviously on day one, if the contract says that we can purchase this, or we can purchase the asset at the end of the lease term for 10 Rand, but if we look at our crystal ball, it tells us that this asset is probably going to be worth 80 Rand 
at the end of the lease term. Then obviously it will be stupid for the, not stupid, but it will be strange if the lessee does not exercise that option to buy an asset for 10 Rand that is actually worth 80 Rand. So if we have this situation, if the um, option to purchase is probably going to be much less than the, the actual fair value of the asset at the end of the lease term, that's an indication that the lessee is going to purchase the asset at the end. So risks and rewards of ownership um, will probably transfer. Okay. Also, if the lease term is for a major part of the economic life of the underlying asset, um, even if title is not transferred, then this is also an indication that actually it's more of a finance lease than an operating lease. So, for example, if this asset can be used for 10 years, okay, but the lease term is for nine and a half years, can you see that it's, um, so essentially there's going to be six months left um, of this, that this asset can still be used after the lease term has expired. So it means that actually, in effect, the lessee has used this asset for its full um, economic life. So therefore, even if, even if ownership does not transfer, all the risks and rewards for that asset for the full 10 years have transferred to the lessee. Okay. Um, also, if we calculate the present value of all the future lease payments, um, and we find that that present value, so the present value, um, is really more or less equal to substantially the fair value of the asset on day one, then that's also an indication that actually this lessee is purchasing this asset, not just um, uh, not just leasing it for a uh, period and then then giving away so so the, or, or then um, stop stopping to use it so so this is an indication that um, this lessee actually chose to enter into a lease rather than to just go buy this asset um, outright um, but in effect it's actually the same as a purchase transaction so it's just a, a different financing transaction so therefore the risks and rewards have have transferred. Okay, and then also if the asset is of a specialized nature, here we always use the example of an ambulance. So obviously there won't, won't be many lessees who will want to um, lease an ambulance. So if we now take a, a minibus and we convert it into an ambulance and we lease it out to Netcare 911, then, you know, that's probably also because it's so specialized that only they can use it or there are so few people who are going, or organizations that can use this asset. That's also an indication that actually the risks and rewards have transferred. Okay, so we see, can you see the principle base? We are giving some examples, but not really strict rules. Okay, um, I see a question here. Um, would this also be the case if the lease term is 55%? Good question of the economic life. So the term is 5.5 years and the life is 10 years. So it talks about the major part. No guidance is provided to us on what is a major part. I would suggest that 55% uh, is not really a major part. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a majority, but it's not the major part. So, um, but this is, a, like I said, it's principle based. You, you will have to convince your, your auditor um, that this is the case, it is the full major part or it isn't. Um, yes, so it will definitely be subjective. Um, my gut feeling says more like maybe 70% and up, but that's just my gut feeling. It depends on, on the question. Good. Okay, so this is our normal situations that might lead to a finance lease. But then in paragraph 64, we are also uh, provided with some additional indicators. Okay, but before we get there, I see a question. Can you please explain the um, uh, specialized nature again? Okay, so specialized nature is just, um, if I as a lessor now have an asset, so there is my asset that I'm going to lease out. Um, if there are many different types of lessees that can use this asset, then, um, you know, maybe then, or usually, let's say, usually under usual normal circumstances, there might be this asset and many lessees might want to use it. But if I now take this asset and I modify it, I don't know, I put bigger wheels on it and I modify it specifically for a lessee 
let's say that that lessee is in the in the mining industry and where this lessee is this uh, vehicle has to move over very rough terrain or whatever the case may be so it's very specialized it's actually so specialized that all these lessees will now not be interested in in this asset anymore they won't be interested to lease this asset anymore it's so specialized that it's actually only this one lessee who's now mining in this very rough terrain or whatever will be able to use it then that's also an indication that um, um, that this asset I'm, I'm actually doing it modifying this asset it's so specialized for us for a specific lessee or a specific type of lessee um, that it's more of a finance lease than it will be an operating lease because uh, for it to be an uh, the risks and rewards will probably now be transferred to that lessee. Um, I'm not going to keep it because I can't, there aren't many other lessees that I can, you use it for three months, you use it for six months. I can't really do that because it's so specialized. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so paragraph 64, we get some additional guidance on, um, um, yeah, we get some additional guidance on whether to classify a lease as a finance lease or an operating lease. Um, so here we see that if the lessee cancels the lease, um, then the losses for the lease, any losses that the lessor might incur, um, <clears throat> if that becomes the lessee's problem, then that is an indicator that this is probably a finance lease. But if the lessee cancels and the lessor has to carry um, those losses, then it's it's an indication that it's probably an operating lease. Okay, <clears throat> the fair value or the residual, um, uh, um, as if, um, if well, the gains or losses from the fluctuation, the fair value of the residual, if that accrues to the lessee, so if the fair value goes up, goes up, and the lessee benefits from that. Um, then that's an indication that this is actually a finance lease. But if the fair value goes up and the um, they saw benefits from that, then it's probably an operating lease because this is one of the the rewards of ownership, the risks and rewards of ownership. Who does it go to? The lessee or the lessor? Is it transferred or not? Um, also, if the lessee has the ability to continue the lease for a secondary period at a rent amount, a lease a payment amount that is substantially lower than the market rent. If that's the case, then it's also an indication that um, this lease, uh, lessee is probably going to continue using this asset for a longer period, meaning that the risks and rewards of ownership will transfer. Okay. Um, food. Okay, so those are the additional indicators. So in example eight, we're not going to do example eight now in, 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 um, in detail in class. It's a, like I said, it's a discussion question. Um, the answers are not always, it's not always that clear cut whether it should be finance lease or operating lease, have the risks and rewards transferred um, or not. Um, but it's basically in example eight, that the question that we have to ask ourselves is whether the risks and rewards associated with owners, uh, with ownership um, for the asset have transfer, transferred in substance to the lessee at the end of the lease, lease term. And the answer, if the answer to that is yes, then uh, the lessor must classify it as a finance lease. And if the answer to that is no, the lessor will um, classify it as an operating lease. Okay, so we'll use these um, in indicators that they provide us, um, uh, the normal indicators as well as the additional indicators. We'll discuss, or you'll see in the, in the, in the uh, example, we'll discuss all of that. So this is what the theory says, let's apply it to um, the information and the question. And based on that, we'll say, oh, um, it seems as if basically, even though this, um, even though, for example, this one isn't met and this one isn't met, Basically, it comes down to the fact that risks and, um, and rewards of ownership have transferred, therefore it is a finance lease. Okay, so I am not going to um, um, do example 8 now in class, but you please go and have a look at, um, at that in, in, um, for your homework. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, Mr. Armstrong, because it's very subjective, in a test situation, will the markers be lenient with the marking as long as your answer is substantiated well? Yeah, so um, in a discussion question, um, we might actually give you a situation um, that is very, that has, uh, that's not that clear cut, where it's not um, clear, yes, this is an operating lease or yes, uh, or it is a finance lease. So we might give you a situation where it's, um, 
uh, where, it's, where it's very gray and you have to then talk yourself through it and convince us of what what, uh, what you think so in that case yes so if you if you get to a um, uh, to an answer that is now different from this from the suggested solution um, um, then um, you know so as long as your reasons are uh, stated very uh, good then you will get your marks however know that in a, in a calculation question um, it will be uh, we will not give you we will make it clear that this is a finance lease or this is an operating lease otherwise um, it will be very difficult to mark so discussion questions that might be a little bit gray areas so there your conclusion you have to get to a conclusion but we'll mark that conclusion based on what you've discussed but a dis uh, calculation question it has to um, uh, we'll make it clear whether it's a finance lease or an operating lease okay um oh no good so um uh, um let me just quickly check i wanted to stop here okay there we go um so uh yeah i'm going to stop here um we will uh continue uh, in tomorrow's lecture look at the uh, specifically a finance lease um but for now uh, so your uh, the questions the homework that you have please i said you have to do go and look at example eight and then um the questions 10 and question 14 those were um, homework questions that i gave to you on thursday but because we didn't get to that in the lecture um that will now be your new homework for after today's lecture. Okay, um, so so that's it from me today. Any any other questions or issues? Okay, we'll delve into the lessor in more detail tomorrow. We'll start with uh, specifically the finance lease, um, and look at the initial recognition, the subsequent recognition. But for now. Just know that there are these two different types of lessors and know that these are the um, criteria that you have to look at to determine um, whether it is a, should be classified as finance or operating. Okay, it seems as if there are no any further questions. Oh, here we go. Um, what would happen if the underlying asset happens to break down uh, beyond repair before the lease period ends and the lessor gets a new asset to replace the initial underlying asset? Uh, you mean the lessee gets a new asset? Uh, the lease they saw provides the lessee with a new uh, so if that is the case if if our lease contract says that when the asset breaks down um during the the, the lease term and the lessor will replace it with a new one can you see that that's a in, strong indication that the risks and rewards of ownership did not transfer to the lessee the lessor is actually now sitting with that stuck in the with that broken down machine um, so that's the case if the if the lease agreement says that when like for example we have that in our office with our, um, our photocopy machines. So if that machine breaks, we just get on the phone and we phone Xerox and say, "Hey guys, the machine break, broke down," and the next day they come and they bring us a new one. So definitely the risk and rewards of ownership of that machine did not transfer to us. It's still sitting with with Xerox. Okay. How would the lessor recognize a lease of an underlying low value asset um, where the lessee elects to apply the, oh, good question. Um, but that's why I said that's actually, it's irrelevant to the lessor whether the lessee applied the recognition exemption or not. So you, you saw now that to decide on how to classify a lease, we didn't even look at asset value or period of well, period of the lease. We looked at a little bit, but it's irrelevant for for the lessor whether the lessee applied the recognition exemption um, or not. So what what could happen is that the um, uh, so the lessee the lessee might apply the recognition um, exemption and therefore um, no. So, so, so the, yeah, let me just think about it. Um, the lessee might decide to apply that, that the lessee will not have a, a right of use um, asset in, in, on its side. Whereas the lessor uh, might actually decide, oh no, this is an operating lease, meaning the lessor will also not uh, um, recognize the asset. For the same lease transaction, it means that the lessee is not recognizing an asset, the lessor is not recognizing an asset, so no one is recognizing this asset. 
So that might actually happen. That's what I spoke about this, almost like a little bit of an inconsistency between the lessee treatment and the lessor treatment, because they're not both using the same rules to decide how to uh, account for, for the leases. So that might happen. Okay, um, <clears throat> for the lessee, how would you do the reassessment if a female and male <laughs> reassessment happened on the same date? Um, okay, gosh. That is, <laughs> now you're making it very tricky, uh, Mr. Bolter. Hmm, good, good question. Expect to see that in a year test. Uh, no, I, um, okay, so I, we will, we will not, we will not do that because it, it, I suppose it can happen in practice that you can actually have a lease payments that change based on an index or a rate as well as the fact that uh, um, uh, uh, the lessee changes their mind. With, uh, Oh, you can hear me. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, she's back. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think maybe that's a sign. <laughs> maybe Blackboard is telling us that we should end it here. Um, uh, so, Mr. Walker, I see a, a question there. I'm going to stop the, the um, um, recording and, um, yeah. Um, and if, if there are any questions that I missed with this in and out, then please just post it um, on the discussion board or send us an email. Okay. So um, let me just stop. Well, so goodbye and. Thank